got uh, Jared and Corey here uh, to talk to you about uh, aerosol painting and their love for that stuff. So um, I'm just going to actually probably just jump it over to them and get the show going. Uh, I'll have some information at the end. Maybe just uh, go ahead and um, share what you want to share, and then at the end, like if there's some extra time, we'll do some question and answers too. So. Who are you? <laughs> I'm Dan Francis. I'm the part of the educational part of uh, FMVA, uh, which is an organization that likes to share art with fellow uh, people in the community. So I'll give the FMVA a speech at the end, maybe. Uh, if you aren't members, uh, you can look up some information at fmva.org, but uh, or like us on Facebook. But uh, I'll do that uh, commercial at the end of the speech. <laughs> but uh, uh, um, yeah, I'm Dan Francis. I'll be somewhat of a host today, but these guys are going to be talking. So. Enjoy the show. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Thanks everybody for coming. Awesome to see so many people here. People we know, people we don't. Um, we don't really get a chance to talk about this uh, part of our work a lot, so you're all going to see some stuff tonight that you might be uh, the first type of people seeing. So. And if you have any questions, feel free to just raise your hand or interject. Questions, anytime. comments, objections, anything, please. Um, so yeah, we, we run a business now called Notorious Signs. Um, so we specialize in hand-painted signs, traditional uh, sign painting, lettering techniques. Um, a little bit about us, we both went to school for graphic design, um, and then later found, thank you, <laughs> found uh, sign painting. It was an awesome transition for us because uh, we started off by painting graffiti, painting lots of graffiti. Um, so yeah, uh, this talk we're gonna basically focus on um, a lot of our graffiti, a lot of our work. Um, most of it's probably five plus years old. So at that time we kind of decided we should uh, focus on things that make money and won't get you arrested. So, um, so yeah. So basically we're gonna start by giving you just a little bit of a background. Um, everyone knows what graffiti is. Everyone probably knows where graffiti comes from. Um, New York City was the mecca. Uh, from late 1960s, early 1970s, it's really, that was the birth of graffiti and the graffiti movement. Um, starting at, yeah, New York, it's kind of, uh, it's not 100% certain of where exactly it started, but everyone considers New York the mecca for graffiti. <clears throat> and the pictures you see up here are kind of the, letter forms that you may see in certain graffiti pieces um, in different mediums. Hip-hop culture, the break dancing, um, you, can, you can see how you, you kind of twist the letter forms, twist your bodies in very similar ways. What we want to show is that I mean, these graffiti styles don't come from just nowhere. Um, they come from kind of a visual landscape that was around at the time. Um, we're talking 1960s, 1970s. Um, bright colors, bold lettering, um, loud. Um, yeah, and basically the birth of hip hop made graffiti into something that was competitive. Um, just like rappers or DJs battle, graffiti artists would battle, um, basically pushing the, uh, pushing the art form forward. You wanna be better than everyone else. You wanna be up in more places, you wanna do more complex letter forms. Um, the thing to remember too, um, at this time, Graffiti was done by kids. We're talking teenagers, uh, 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, and the things that they're into is stuff like this. Comic books, candy wrappers, cereal boxes, um, sports Car logos. Cartoons in general. Basically. Yeah, stuff that's expressive, stuff that's fun, stuff that's loud and bold. Um, these are basically the types of things that graffiti writers saw and tried to emulate with their own lettering. Um, so basically, your original graffiti lettering looks like stuff like this. And if you kind of go back and forth, you can see a lot of the same types of colors, a lot of the same types of movement, <clears throat> stuff that's got a lot of energy to it. <coughs> and it was on trains. <clears throat> so basically, graffiti writers in New York um, understood that if you uh, write your name on a wall, it just, people walk by and see it. But if you write your name on a train, goes all over the city and everyone sees it all over the place. Yep. So once graffiti found the trains, um, it was kind of, a, kind of a match made in heaven. Yeah, it became a rolling, rolling billboard for yourself. 
what way, better way to advertise than uh, something that you have to look at? And if you're in New York, this stuff's right in front of your face all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, the point of graffiti is to be seen and it's to be expressive. Um, and the trains were just a perfect platform for that. Um, what happened though was it got a little bit out of control in New York. Um, the outsides and insides were destroyed. Um, people started complaining. It's a quality of life issue. It's ugly. It's there's just way too much graffiti. <laughs> it became such a problem that action had to be taken, <clears throat> and therefore, by the late 1980s, it just got shut down. They cleaned all the cars, redid everything, <clears throat> and basically the stopped graffiti on the subways. Consequences of that, um, before that happens, graffiti was really concentrated on the subways. Um, people weren't painting the city, people, weren't, people wanted to paint trains. If you were doing graffiti, you were painting trains. Um, other cities was like the same way too, but as soon as the subways got shut down, graffiti writers turned to the next best thing, freight trains. Freight trains. So, Basically, it's kind of a funny thing, too, because the first writers who were painting freight trains were only doing it because they couldn't paint subways, um, and there was nothing else to paint. So it was like, oh, this thing is on wheels, it moves. It's not quite a subway train, but... It's the next best thing. Close enough. Yeah. Um, but at that time, they didn't really realize the, uh, the potential of the freight train network and how that was going to spread styles from New York to... LA to Canada to Mexico to North Dakota, um, basically everywhere in between. So before we dig too deep into the freight train graffiti, one side note, um, these are monikers, this is hobo graffiti. This stuff has been around since 1920s, 1930s, earlier. Um, these were traveling workers who would ride the rails town to town looking for work. Um, and they would adopt nicknames, write them on the rails, write them on the trains um, to communicate with each other. Yeah, leave each other messages and, and just kind of spreading their message through their, <clears throat> their own type of graffiti. This stuff's really fascinating too. If you look up monikers, I mean, you could do a speech on just these and talk for, talk for hours. Um, really cool culture. Um, basically was a precursor to the graffiti movement and that it was done on freight trains and that these people took nicknames and it was all about uh, kind of starting an identity for yourself beyond what you actually are. It's, uh, it's, it's people, yeah, it's uh, your alter ego on the train. You can, you can put whatever you want and that just shows yourself. So we threw this in here just to show you the, uh, the freight train kind of map of the United States. Um, this map is 1890. Um, if you look at it, it's really kind of, this is the backbone of our country. This is how the country was built. This is why cities are placed where they're placed. Um, and this was all in place 100 years before the graffiti movement started to take advantage of this. Um, and it's only grown from there. More, more trains, more train lines, more freight cars. <clears throat> The cool thing about this too, um, we're in like the exact middle of the continent. Um, everybody knows Fargo is a good place to watch trains. Um, Fargo is built here because this is where the lion went across the river. Um, Fargo was built along the train line. Um, so now if you're watching a train go by, you're seeing work from west coast, east coast, Canada, down to Texas. Yeah. Everywhere. Everything comes through here. We're the center of the continent. So all these places have kind of developed their own, their own styles of writing. Um, it's kind of like a dialect or an accent. Each place has a different, uh, different style, different twist, different influences. Um, and what the Freights did was kind of start cross-pollinating that, bringing stuff from one place to another place, bringing it to Fargo, North Dakota, um, where we saw it. Yeah, and that's what caught our attention. So, we're gonna start getting into some of our work here. Um, this is like one of the first pieces I ever painted, 2006. Um, emulating graffiti that we found 
on the freight trains. We'd go to the That's yard and just look at stuff, take pictures, take note. Um, Faust is the word I wrote. It's supposed to be like Faust. Um, I thought it was cool at the time. I don't know, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was 10 years ago. That was so. 10 years ago, yeah. So um, after that, I started writing church. I wrote this for a while. Um, we were really into doing like these type styles. Um, we called them like font styles back then. Well, this isn't quite your traditional graffiti lettering, um, but it's something a little bit more graphic, a little bit more, um, yeah, it's typographic style. Straight lines. Um, Block letters, you know, it's a, it's a starting point. Each, all letters like have their basis, but then graffiti, you change it up and put your own style onto it. This is kind of um, boiled down. Uh, loaf, um, again, you know, it's nearly 10 years ago. I don't know exactly why I chose the word, but, <laughs> so, um, but you know, it, it, it deals it with, good idea at the time, yeah. yeah, it deals with letters. Um, just some things I like about those letters that <clears throat> made them fit and just happen to be loaf. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, everyone starts somewhere and as you grow, you change and your pieces reflect that. <coughs> We threw those in there just kind of as a starting point. Um, this is some of the first stuff we did. Um, basically from beyond that, we started thinking, we're influenced by all these graffiti styles. Um, the Midwest is kind of a distilled graffiti style, taking things from West Coast, East Coast, um, up North, down South. But we wanted to kind of work in some other stuff that we like too. Um, some of the stuff we were into was like these psychedelic posters. We love stuff like this, I still do. Um, the colors, I love the colors. It's real bold, real wild. Um, if you'll notice, there's not a lot of like black and white. It's a lot, it's kind of a flat wall of just color. Um, and that's something that we kind of tried to incorporate into our, into our work too. Um, the letter forms are just really, really fluid. Everything's got a lot of motion. Um, everything kind of fits into each other. It's kind of melting and morphing and moving. And, yeah, it's, we like that. Yeah. I don't know. It's always interesting. Um, other stuff we were into, like old medieval typography, um, super ornate capital, um, black letter forms, um, old manuscripts, stuff like this. Um, yeah. I can show you, we'll show you a little bit later on how kind of some of these forms uh, directly, we borrowed directly from uh, this type of stuff which is basically from, you know, 1400s, 1500s, hundreds of years ago. But we kind of realized that uh, it's all lettering. It's all the way you do it. The only thing that's different is uh, that we're doing it with spray paint. Well, these guys were doing it with a brush. Probably by candlelight, too. <laughs> Again, yeah, it's, you know, another examples of illuminated <coughs> letters that, you know, we've been interested always looking at it and, and just kind of borrowing f ideas from, from what we've seen. Um, yeah, and obviously it's stood the test of time and that's got to be good to some extent. So yeah, always interesting to look at. Yeah, the point is that graffiti was nothing new. Um, it's all letter forms. Um, it all is based in, you know, tradition, <coughs> hundreds, thousands of years of tradition um, that you can borrow from, basically build off of. Uh, we're into like space and Just I don't know nebulas and stuff. Visually, yeah, yeah, visually stimulating and, yeah. and stuff <clears throat> that we can borrow from. So basically, you combine all those things into a graffiti style. Um, you get something like this. So I started writing Pulse. Um, I have no idea what year this is. 2010, mm -hmm. maybe. I would say something like that. Yeah. But we're basically trying to work all those things in there. Um, the colors and the fill, the way I kind of lay it in. Um, it's kind of got like some depth, spaciness to it. The letters all kind of fit together. Um, nothing's really overlapping. Everything is kind of just molded together. It's got like a whole bunch of movement. It's fluid. Um, yeah, that's what I was trying to do. All the little cuts and things that are coming out of there um, kind of harken back to like this type of stuff. And if you look at like the form of this, uh, that shape that comes up there like that, that curve, <clears throat> was what I always tried to build my, uh, my letters off. 
So that side of the P takes like that kind of exact same shape. Another example, probably around that same time period. Um, it's weird because I used yellow on this piece and I hate yellow. <laughs> but I think one of those things is that uh, when you grow up painting graffiti and you're learning how to do these things, um, certain limitations held you back. And one of those was that yellow spray paint is terrible and it sucks and it's awful. It doesn't cover anything. So I never used yellow spray paint. So to this day, I struggle with using yellow. <laughs> I just can't do it. I mean, <laughs> Again, yeah, going back to our influences and, you know, taking, taking the space theme and just kind of covering the gray boxcar is, is something, adding color to that uh, really kind of makes your, the piece where taking all the color out of the piece and just putting it in the background makes it pop out even further, <clears throat> kind of accentuates it, and uh, it, it works, you know, it, Nothing, or it doesn't all have to be all colorful all the time. You can different ideas, re get different products at the end. Those uh, the flared out tops too, something that we would end up doing a lot in a lot of our pieces. That was kind of like a natural thing because uh, you can only reach so high, and so basically to paint as high as you can, you have to kind of flare your can out, um, yep. and that's just what naturally happens. So after a while, we kind of started doing that intentionally because we liked the way it looked. Another piece from that time period. Um, yeah, just kind of a standard one. The background um, was something that would kind of give me some ideas for some later pieces that we would do, where I would lay kind of one color into another color. Yeah. You guys co-signing? Yeah. On the, on the well, bottom we always throw each other up. Um, I should mention too, C and T stands for Centralia's Notorious Team. That was an idea we came up with when we were in like 16. Well, it was Centralia's Notorious 2. It was. Then uh, it became Centralia's Notorious 3. And then it uh, became Centralia's Notorious Team. Yeah. Or Clean, Neat, and Tidy. Or uh, Class's Next Teachers. Yeah. Um, it, it, the list goes on. Cloud 9 but, Team. Yeah. You know. But yeah, the way I did the background, um, I would lay one color, blend that into another color, and then kind of carry some lines um, from one to another. So it kind of. It would give me some ideas. Another random piece from that time period. I don't know, just having fun with it. Um, the idea, yeah, you have to look at freight trains. These things roll right in front of you, so talk about a captive audience. I mean, it's perfect to do yeah. stuff like this. You can, you can put out any message on there, and they have to look at it, unless if they're, go ahead. Sometimes, um, the thing is it's always spontaneous. Um, you can't really try to plan it out too much. There's always going to be something that throws you for a loop every time. You yeah. never know what you're going to get. Yeah. Um, you could have it planned out as good as you want, but then one of your cans clogs or... So you have to, yeah, you got to kind of think on the fly and, and kind of roll with the punches when you're out there painting. But How long does it take you to do a piece like this? Something like this, maybe 45 minutes, an hour? Give or yeah. take, yeah. You know, it always <clears throat> depends on the circumstances and problem solving. So, yeah, that's about roughly an hour. Yeah. Are you doing this at night time? Yes, yes, for the most part. Which uh, <clears throat> introduces a lot of other challenges, too. Um, you can kind of, you don't really know what your piece is going to look like until you see it in the daytime, too. Yeah. You paint at night, you yeah, kind of know what colors yeah. you're working with, <laughs> um, but there's only, that only takes you so far. Um, so yeah, you get better at it, I don't know. Um, so are you guys going to get some color for doing this now? Who asked that? <laughs> yeah. uh, like I said, this stuff's all like five, ten years old. We Googled statute of limitations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're in the clear. As far as as far as I know, if you believe what you read on the internet on lawyer.com, yes. I think we're good. <laughs> it's three years. If anyone's wondering, it's <laughs> it's three years. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, for it, you know, freight trains. There, it's such a vast pool of cars out there, millions of cars, and unlike the subways, you need to paint more to make a bigger splash, 
And so it's, it turns into a numbers game as to like who can paint more type of thing. And you know, with my uh, letter choices on the left there, um, it's like a throw up style. It's meant to be super fast, super um, easily re readable. Um, bubble letters, you, you could call them. Marshmallow letters, you know, it all depends on who you're asking. But yeah, it's, it's a numbers game and it just, you need to paint more to, to really be known in that sense. Basically lettering is kind of, it's all an evolution. Um, it's the way those, we think of graffiti, we think of those kind of bubble letter styles. The reason that that's popular is because it's fast to do. That's how you cover up the most space. That's how you do it in the fastest way. Um, so it evolved because of necessity um, rather than, it is an aesthetic choice too, but uh, we caught a worker in the background walking there too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the cool thing too, um, once you paint a train, you're most likely never ever going to see it again. Um, Nine times out of ten, it's just gone. There's trains out there. Um, it's pretty much out of your hands, it's gone. But there's people all over the country who like to take pictures of trains and like to post them on the internet. So once in a while you'll find something that you did um, somewhere totally different. And I think this was like near Alberta, Canada, or yeah, not quite way up. Yeah, around Canada. Vancouver, not quite close to the coast, <clears throat> but yeah, around there. And yeah, it's just uh, a quick search on uh, I think Flickr. Um, it just yeah it popped up. So now we have proof that it went to that spot and someone took a picture of it. Liked it enough to take a picture of it. It's kind of fun to do. Your stuff goes places you've never been and probably won't ever be, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, this piece too, um, it's kind of a influence with like the black letter and the gothic kind of style where, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's got the kind of wicked evilness that you may um, find similar to those. Pointy. Uh, pointy, um, the, the fill style, it's almost like a, an ominous night, you know, it's, and then yellow again. But yeah, when you, even when you get closer to it, you can see the subtleties like in the 3D, like there's a little bit of green that came from the fill and you know, something that you might not catch as it's rolling by you, but it's the extra time that you take to put in those little nuances kind of pushes it even farther. And it's working with the shape of the car too, like how the R like pokes right through the six. Um, one thing that's pretty important um, that any good graffiti writer should do is to not go over the numbers because that's because that's how the workers do their job. That's how they track these things. Um, the goal of this isn't to uh, make anyone's job any harder. Um, it's basically just to add some artwork to something that is boring and ugly on its own. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a certain amount of respect too. You have to respect the freight train. You have to respect the workers who uh, make their living moving these things around. And yeah, this one is a, it's another example of uh, uh, the car I painted and it rolled away and then someone liked it enough and took a picture of it. I believe uh, this one was in Atlanta. Someone took a picture of it there and posted it. <clears throat> yeah. So this is one too. Um, sometimes when you paint, and it always happens when you paint, the, you think what you did the best thing ever and then you, it rolls away and you never see it again. Um, and that's what happened here. We painted this one, it got away, we didn't get a picture of it, and then like a couple of years later we found this one, this picture of it online somewhere. So yeah, this is the only picture that we have of this car and it's not our picture, so. But it's a good feeling when you catch it. Definitely. And then the ones that you never want to see again, those are the <laughs> ones that everyone always takes pictures of. <laughs> the thing too, I mean, you can't really take this back. Um, it's kind of fun to watch a train go by You'll see, uh, you'll see some pieces that are like half done, the outline's half on, the fill's half filled in. Um, you know there's got to be a great story that goes along with that <laughs> in yeah. some way or yeah. another. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then it, it goes into uh, you know, the types of cars that are out there in this area. Um, you know, like I said, we're in the middle of North America. And so, like, for example, this is a Canadian car. Um, and each car is different. Uh, the ridges on there, there's different bars and just 
holes and yeah, um, it kind of it differs every time you paint. And for example, like the the bar itself is pretty big and it goes back a couple inches, but then it's not flat; it's very rounded. So you have to it makes you paint differently. And following the contour of the train, it's hard sometimes. But yeah, so yeah. Again, also taping off the numbers is a technique you can do to cover, cover the numbers, paint, and then just rip off the duct tape. And you're left with clean lines around the numbers so you don't have to worry about it being stamped. Because a lot of times that's what companies do to put the numbers back on so it makes the jobs easier. They'll put like a big like box around where the numbers are and they'll put the numbers back on there. But if you tape them off like that and they can still read it, they won't touch it. So it adds longevity to it too, but not fluorescent paints. Oh yeah, and uh, also like the, in the fill here, um, after, after painting so much, you kind of have to keep pushing yourself and kind of coming up with being creative, coming up with new ideas. And in this case, um, using fluorescent paint. If you ever use fluorescent paint, it doesn't cover at all. It's, it's not opaque, and which you have to kind of do it differently. You got to put a base coat underneath, and then the fluorescent on top, um, just to make it you know, visible. Because if it was just on a on a car, it would probably just get soaked in, and just might as well not even use it at that point. But yeah, it's just it's something after <clears throat> you, you're painting so much, and you need to kind of keep it interesting so to speak, and try new things and experiment. So something we got into, um, basically it was just experimenting with the paint. Um, like you said, the fluorescent paint is terrible and doesn't cover, but it comes in a can that's a male can. Regular spray paint comes in a female can. So if you think about it, we put them together <laughs> and uh, we can make our own colors. Like literally like plugging them into each other and transferring paint from can to can. And it was, it's a process. You put one in the freezer, you like boil some water, you like put one in there, <laughs> and then you like jam them together so like the pressure like explodes into the other one. Basically, that's, yeah, you know. It's a messy job. It's, yeah, it's not exact so, science. It's also yeah. probably why we didn't get a security deposit back yeah. in the place. But. That's a whole nother story. Yeah. And, and you know, when you do that too, you don't know exactly what you're getting when you're mixing you know, a red and a blue or something, is it gonna be the right purple that you want? You know, you just don't know until you, you figure it out. Yeah, if you take like out. a two thirds can full of white and just blast a little bit of like a fluorescent color, like in this case it's green, you get like a really cool, like minty, somewhat like fluorescent. Glow, like glow in the dark green. green. Yeah, is basically what this turned out to be. Else. More pieces, again, like that flared out top technique. Um, just kept playing with stuff like that. Um, make the piece look like it's kind of like evaporating. Um, yeah, just experimenting with it. More pieces too. One thing we like to do also was uh, basically use everything that a can of spray paint can do. Um, you can paint really, really clean lines with it, but you can also get it to like drip and everything like that. Um, so yeah, we want to just use everything you can. And I like that kind of mixture of dirty and clean, um, loose to tight. Uh, this piece here, um, you know, we don't paint a whole lot of walls. Um, so it's always weird kind of painting bottoms of your letters if you're not used to it. Which, yeah, some of you w wouldn't really think about, but it happened. Um, but yeah, and then this one, um, I, I took the idea to paint this wall because the, the paint was so just disappearing so fast. Even while I was painting it, big chips were coming off and I had to like go over some spots twice because it was like aged as I was painting it. Um, but yeah, so it's just a different aesthetic that gives your piece a different look, different texture, and keeps it interesting. Um, and then yeah, so as you can see, it uh, is disappearing pretty fast. Um, this is uh, less than a year after I painted it, and yeah, it looks like it's been there for ten years. Kind of fun thing to see is like what happens to your pieces. Um, it's not like normal art where you make something and you have control of it. You kind of make something, 
and you let it out into the wild where it has to kind of <laughs> deal with the elements, with other people. Yeah, you um, know, it, it's just out there in the public um, and anyone can do anything to it. You just don't know until you go and see if it's still there. Um, yeah, and this, uh, this piece here, it has a lot of kind of space influence. Um, again, the flared tops. Uh, we're try trying to paint as big as we can in the space that we're allowed. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, this one specifically too, like, you're out there with your friends, um, your partners, and you kind of want to keep pushing each other, trying new things, experimenting. Um, and being creative the whole time, and you kind of just, the goal is to paint the best piece possible and the wildest piece possible. Basically pushing your boundaries and the boundaries of graffiti too. And you know, that's the <clears throat> product, basically. Here's another one. Um, kind of threw this in here just to kind of show you. The interesting thing about graffiti is you only ever see like the finished product. You never really see everything that went into it. Um, so every piece is like a different story. There's all kinds of stuff that happens, um, but you don't really get to, uh, get to say that next to the piece. This one, like, I have mosquitoes everywhere. <laughs> it's getting eaten alive. That ledge is like this high. So we had to like climb on top of that and like bend over all weird and try to like. Yeah, we are hunched over painting and standing on you know, four inches of concrete and hanging on for dear life after, I don't know, with a five foot drop behind us. And just, you know, it's, it's things like that that you don't see in the picture. Here's one, like, I, I don't think these look particularly good, but what we did was just try to change it up, just try to do something different, um, change up the regular painting um, technique where you paint your fill first, you outline it, go through all these steps. Um, we were just trying to mess around with different textures, um, do the outline uh, first, then kind of cut over it with the fill. Um, make, it look, make it look sketchy. I don't know, make it, it's, a, it's just a different <clears throat> approach to painting. I was into like impressionism stuff at the time where it's the strokes, it's uh, making it textural, making it uh, more painterly almost. Usually what happens when you just keep pushing it really far and just, I don't know, go wild on it. So here's one that kind of I was talking about um, with the background of one of those first pieces where basically we came up with this idea, instead of laying your letters out, we would just kind of paint an entire background and just fade a few different colors into each other. And then we would take, uh, like in this case, we would take the orange and that's your outline over the blue. And then over the blue, your outline is coming from the orange. Um, I don't know, it makes kind of a cool effect. Just on something we had never seen before. And yeah. Yeah, you just keep trying new stuff. I don't know. Another like real kind of a uh, spacey one. It's got that kind of definitely like the psychedelic poster color combo. Um, the only black is around the piece. The only white are those lines coming uh, from inside of it. I like to think it's got like tractor beams, it's getting like abducted. <laughs> More pieces. Yeah, um, yeah like, uh, can we go back to the next one? Yeah, like uh, when, you're, when you're painting too, like you're gonna find yourself uh, painting over bars and ridges and all that and you can kind of see on the piece on the left, the bar is actually sticking out like four or five inches. So you're painting, and you have to paint the bar, and you gotta go back to the car. It's, yeah, it, it's just obstacles that get in your way that you have to think on the fly and fix it. So by far the most recent thing in here. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it's, the, it's the legal wall downtown. If you don't know it exists, it's <clears throat> behind the form building. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, keeps things interesting and going there, you never know who you're going to run into. Um, you know, this is a, a, a font style again. It's, it was kind of a, as it says on the left there, lazy Sunday. Just kind of keep things, you guys stay in practice too. Um, especially now when we're transitioning to more of a legitimate business, you know, you can't promise something that you can't do, so to speak. So, yeah, that's 
and the legal wall is perfect for that. So. Yeah, part of the reason why we're talking about all this stuff too is that we have a legal wall now. So when we were growing up doing this stuff, we didn't have anywhere else to go paint and practice and do this stuff. Um, now people do. Now it's becoming more of an accepted art form. Um, people are realizing, like you people who are here and listening to us talk about it, um, it's all lettering, it's all design, it's all typography. Um, it's all legitimate skills that you can later kind of turn into something else, um, like we did by going into graphic design and sign painting. Um, those are all skills that we already learned from painting graffiti. It was just uh, put the can down and picked up a brush. Here's just something fun. Um, we used to just like go to the bar and get out a <laughs> napkin and a pen and just kind of pass the napkin around and just see draw what letters. we come with. Come up just with, get yeah. loose with it, get, have fun with it. Yeah. Um, there's, there's no right or wrong. It's just let's draw. Yeah, it's just drawing, just having fun. So that leads to kind of stuff like this. Um, this is behind like the Red Raven, kind of. Yeah, in the alleyway. Uh, but yeah, it's the same same idea. It's just uh, uh, a a good collection of different styles and you know, make it work together. Um, no reason why we pick certain styles over others, but it's just, uh, it's like a bunch of ideas all collaged into one, one piece. And it keeps things interesting. <clears throat> so we started doing more, uh, more murals and stuff like that. Um, here's one we did in Fergus Falls at the Spot restaurant. Um, it's got a lot of the same techniques and stuff you can see. Um, like a really clean, really thin, nice outline on the piece, uh, but then like kind of really blurry like trees and stuff like that in the background. Um, there's no black in it, I don't think. Uh, no. The only uh, white. Except yeah. the, the up top, I think, is outlined. In. The only white is like that sunburst um, right in the middle. So when you get like a good picture of it, it just kind of... Looks like the actual sun yeah. on the wall, which is pretty sweet. Another piece, um, just kind of our style again. Another one, just getting real loose with it, um, experimenting. Yeah, and, and, and this picture was taken at eye level too. So when you when you are standing next to it, you realize the piece is actually like this tall, as high as you can reach. So you kind of you kind of get a sense of the scale that you need to kind of paint in to make a splash on the car and have it being visible as it's going by you at 30 miles an hour. The whole idea of graffiti is to be unique. Uh, it's to develop your own style. Um, it really doesn't matter what you write. It's all about how you write it. Um, yeah. Uh, when you guys are going into, say, do you put something on a train, do you have a plan in mind? Like, do you sketch things out beforehand, or do you, is it purely spontaneous? Um, well, uh, sketch, not all the time. You, you may have an idea or like you drew something earlier that day and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna go paint that. Um, but the, the most thing that is planned out is like your paint, you know, what colors you're bringing. You have an idea of like, I'm gonna outline with this color, you know, but always, you know, there's the wild cards thrown in there and something doesn't work and you have to replace it or you run out of a certain color, gotta replace it with something else. So it's, it's planned out, but it's not, if that makes sense. Yeah, the thing is, too, you paint the same letters over and over and over and over. So you start to kind of realize the relationships between them. You start to kind of fall back on the same, uh, the same basic structure, but you just keep tweaking it a little bit. Um, you just keep pushing it. Um, like we said, it's all this evolution. You just keep trying different stuff. Um, but you're kind of building off that same base. But like something like this, there was no plan. Um, that one, like absolutely no plan. You just kind of go with just, it, I guess. Yeah. I don't know, that's a picture you're taking somewhere else. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where this one was taken. Um, but again, you kind of see uh, the scale of the, or the size that you need to be able to, to paint at. Um, and thank God for high pressure spray paint. So you spray upwards to get even larger. Um, but yeah, that's essentially uh, what you need to do to, you know, if you have a small piece going by on the, on the train, you're not going to be able to read it. You're not going to know who it was. Might as well not even be there. But yeah, that's... More pieces, just something different. Again, um, the only black is like the, the force field, the outline that goes all the way around the piece. Kind of just makes it more of a, I don't know, more of a shape. 
you guys use a certain brand paint? You guys only like use like one brand of spray paint? I would say ninety percent of this is done with good old rust oleum. Yeah. So, so at what point is the graphic design? You actually been studying graphic design. At what point does that kind of fall? into you doing this? Is, is there an overlap? Uh, it's kind of funny, like most of this, actually most of this work was before we went to college yeah. for graphic design. Okay. Um, this kind of led us to studying lettering and uh, more stuff like that. And it's kind of funny because um, in graphic design I tried to kind of keep graffiti totally separate. I tried to keep them two separate things. Probably most people I went to school with didn't even know I did stuff yeah. like this. Right. Um, yeah. That would have been another question as well. So thank you. Yeah, so I kind of kept them separate, but then we kind of discovered sign painting a couple years ago, where it was like all of a sudden all those skills are super relevant for uh, for what we're doing now. So it kind of came full circle, kind of in a roundabout way. But especially now that the statute limitations are up, you can't, <laughs> uh, you can't actually talk about these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the first time we've ever really showed a lot of this stuff, besides to our like good friends and stuff. So. And did you feel a lot of limitations when you were on the computer against? being out there and spray painting with like freedom, you know? Yeah, um, the thing with like graffiti that's, I think, is interesting and is fun, with graphic design, you're designing for somebody else. Yeah. You're trying to bring their ideas to life. You're trying to bring their style out. Um, graffiti, it's all about you. Yeah. It's, it's selfish, but that's what it is. No, it's, uh, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, you develop your own unique style, whatever yeah. looks best to you. Yeah, you're, um, it's your advertisement, so. It's, but it's, it's really you. good, uh, it's good training. I mean, you learn everything about line, about color, about balance, about lettering. Um, there's lots of, there's a lot of do's and don'ts um, as far as lettering goes in graffiti. Um, the way you connect certain things, um, the way you kind of orient um, the axis of your letters. Um, yeah, and a lot of that is straight from the rules of typography and sign painting and design. Um, yeah. These ones, yeah, it's just pushing it really far. Yeah, and you know, this is this is after painting a whole bunch. You again need to like push yourself. You need to always kind of outdo your last car that you painted, and yeah, you end up with a, kind of a mechanical breakdown of the bar and the structure. And you know, at some point, can you even read it anymore? Is it be, it's just a complete abstraction of what the letter form is, but it's still balanced enough where it works. And then, yeah, the, the color scheme too. Like it, you know, it looks like the mechanical uh, I don't know, monster. I don't know, um, but yeah, it, it's, color schemes like that work. You know, and yeah, I don't know. It kind of ex explains itself, really. Mine from the same car, similar. Um, Thing is too, once we got into the freight train graffiti, we kind of came to the freights because we liked the graffiti, and then we kind of started really appreciating freight train culture. Um, I love the history of it, and I love the design of it. Here's a bunch of logos from like the early 1900s, um, late 1800s, but this stuff is awesome. Um, if there's any other type nerds out there, look up old railroad logos, they're beautiful. Um, and the aesthetic of these things. I don't know, I love it. That kind of influenced my graphic design as well. Just kind of that bold uh, graphic. Yeah, it's, it's the time timeless, timelessness of it too. Like it could work today if, <clears throat> if the Atlantic coastline came back, you could still use that logo and still work. So there's, there's a whole culture that goes along with freight trains that has nothing to do with graffiti. Um, and a lot of people who get into it through graffiti eventually start to appreciate and respect that. Um, dig deeper into it, learn more about it, and yeah, I love that stuff. <clears throat> so he's kind of like the main lines that would come through Fargo, BNSF, um, CN, Burlington Northern. These were like the logos and stuff that we saw a lot. So of course we put our own twists on them and make them our own. Uh, and the stickers over there if you want some, take them. Yeah, please. <clears throat> So this type of stuff we do now, um, like I said, we hardly paint graffiti anymore unless it's at the legal wall. Mm -hmm. um, but we kind of realized that our skill set is perfect for sign painting. We like doing lettering. Um, we like doing it large scale. We like doing it outdoors. Um, so yeah, this is where we 
we kind of took our, uh, our energy that we devoted to graffiti for a long time and made a small adjustment. And now we're just as uh, rabid about sign painting. Yeah, and you know, when, you, when you're painting in the public forum too, you have to be confident on your abilities also. So you can't be like, well, maybe I'll do it. And then you, know, you have something that's bad. But yeah, if you, that's what graffiti has taught us. You have to kind of, kind of know what you're doing and take that extra time to figure it out and learn and, and progress. And that's, you know, after shifting our focus, like we, it's the same thing, just we have permission now. And we get paid, which is awesome. Yeah, and there's money involved. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the type of stuff we do now, that's inside Pound's restaurant. Um, yeah, it's all lettering. And basically the whole point of this talk was just to show that we started off by doing graffiti. Um, we kind of realized it's all lettering, it's all design. That's what kind of led us into uh, where we're at now, which is starting our own business and uh, trying to uh, devote all of our energy and attention into this. But, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So glad I know that you do this now, Corey, than when I had you in class. I'm glad my car wasn't your canvas. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for not turning my car into a graffiti uh, thing. I must have given you a good No drink. problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, many other questions that we didn't ask during the segment that you guys want to ask now? You guys have any other questions? We have, uh, we have a guest book somewhere. Yeah, um, sign the guest book. If you want to leave your emails, we will uh, appreciate it and keep you posted on stuff that we're doing. Too. And take some stickers. Stickers, yeah. Draw in the book also. Mm -hmm. you know. I guess, is there anything like in the workings that we should be on the lookout for? Or? Oh. Well, um, we just moved, we're going to move into a new uh, studio, the Spirit Room, starting in March. Um, it's going to become like our little uh, sign shop. Yeah. So. so that's where yeah. we'll be. Come see us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of freedom do you guys have when you get this opportunity to work for someone? I mean, do they say, like, I mean, how often do you have a choice on color or even the design of the lettering type? Yeah. Most of the time, it's a lot of freedom. Yeah, it's like pretty, this pretty liberal. We completely came up with from scratch. Um, all the lettering, all the color, the color and everything like that. Um, so yeah, most of the time, people are willing to kind of give us the freedom. But uh, what we do now is we are also a production sign shop, so we can basically take a logo, paint it on the wall. Um, but yeah, we love designing, that's what we kind of came from, and that's what we do, so. You guys have any crazy stories from the night when you were doing it at night time? Like, did you ever half finish something, or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is. you want to share with that? Like, uh, uh, I've got crazy a lot, noise. I don't even know. Running into other people yeah. back there? <clears throat> um, I'd say like a good, like, I'd say half the time it goes smoothly, the other half it doesn't. Um, so sometimes, yeah, I've... You don't miss it though? I mean, <laughs> not, I, won't, I, won't, I won't, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. I won't go that far. The funny thing is, um, it, it, you get used to that pressure almost, and that's something that's almost a little bit difficult for me to deal with at least. Um, I don't know why that is. I, I do better, I think, when I'm under Short, short timelines, and yeah, you got deadlines to meet, and you know, add that added pressure really makes you figure out like if you are capable of even pulling it off. So, yeah. You could always subcontract and have someone chase you. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> it's good. yeah, that's good. Yeah, probably not as fast as I was back then. <laughs> yeah. What type of paint did you do for this one? I mean, is this not? No, uh, it's all brush. This uh, is, yeah. yeah. Stencils or, like, no, like, all brush. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. yeah, how we got to this point on the wall is uh, we had uh, the design, we projected it onto the wall, mm -hmm. and essentially traced it on okay. with uh, uh, one shot, one shot enamel. What's kind of cool, too, is when you learn how to brush letter, um, <clears throat> we kind of started making these connections, like, <clears throat> this is where graffiti actually came from. Uh, it's almost like we're taking this like a little bit, a little bit further back. Um, we're like casual lettering. Um, I really think gave birth to kind of a fast way of writing. That's kind of where you see tags, um, hand styles we call them. 
Um, but yeah, learning how to use the brush is something that every designer I think should learn how to do once in a while because you get a kind of you get a good feel of how lighter forms um, are made. You get kind of where they should be thick, where they should be thin, um, the angles. Um, yeah, it's it makes a whole lot more sense once you learn how to work with the brush. And there's so much more freedom with the brush too. It's uh, yeah, definitely it's really pretty pretty cool. Yeah, downtown Fargo itself has a lot of paint, you know, on the side of the building, mm -hmm. like Santa Rosa has that, and uh, there's, there's even an old shrewing <coughs> one on the side of the building that's been. Yeah. Uh, is there? Do you guys want to do more of that stuff, like outside of the buildings? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yep. Um, yep. And what's kind of cool is like Fargo. It has a really rich sign painting history. Um, if you just look around our downtown, you can see all these kind of ghost signs you call them. Uh, that have been there for yeah, 50, like the, uh, 100 years. Uh, beautiful, beautiful stuff that was all done by hand. Um, that kind of stuff kind of fell by the wayside once computer graphics and vinyl took over. Um, but yeah, also there was, <clears throat> for a long time, basically now I think there's one place in the United States that teaches sign painting, <coughs> and it's in LA. But before that, there were two places, LA and Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Um, so yeah, this area has like a really, really rich sign painting history. You kind of just got to look around and know where to look and you'll, uh, you'll start seeing it. Yeah, but, you know, there's still a, a very small handful of people who still practice the traditional <clears throat> for art form of yeah. sign painting. So yeah, it's our goal to kind of uh, keep that alive and work in those yeah. traditions. So for like uh, artists that you guys, like for sign painters, you know, like Von Dutch or Ed Roth or Gerald Tidwell, um, do you guys, uh, like letterheads, do you guys have anybody that you like to kind of pull <coughs> your art form off of for lettering? Um, the, the biggest one is Mike Myers. Okay. Um, he well, he's doing a sh workshop right now, actually, at his, in Mazeppa, Minnesota. But yeah, he's he's the guy who um, I don't know if you've seen Sign Painters, the documentary, uh, but he is featured in that. And uh, yeah, he's been doing it for like what 40, 50 years. Yeah, that like his whole life. And I don't I don't know a guy who has more fun working. Yeah, he's been a big influence on us. Um, locally, the one guy who paints signs is Super Frog, um, Butch in Moorhead. He's awesome, does beautiful work. Um, yeah, like the pinstripers you mentioned, big influences too. We don't do so much pinstriping, I like to experiment with it, but I'm more into letters. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of awesome sign painters out there. You guys only do lettering? Do you do other, like, images? Um, if we did, it would be more, like, illustrative. Um, not, like, portraits or anything like that. But, you know, when, when you're making a sign, too, like, if the client has an idea, and like, like we were saying, if they have a logo with a picture in it, you know, that's something that we can do. <clears throat> um, it's not just limited to letters. Yeah, I mean, we both, we both went to art classes, so we've done our fair share of still lifes and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, when it comes down to it, I love lettering. So probably 99% of what I do is some kind of lettering, which is enough to do forever, I think, and you'll still have plenty of, <laughs> plenty of room to <laughs> explore. Let's thank them again for taking time.